Josué, Agustín Delgado, bai, eta Ainoa Azkarate, e, horra gertzen den enpresan lan egiten dute, eta, e, zera, ikerketa zentua da eta eskuntza zailarekin batu dute lana, olako esperientziak izateko. Gaur izango duzu, e, duzuena hemen, izango da, iker lan, iker ketalan ari buruzko informazioa tungeles, ez, ez da? E, Agustinek egiten du e, lan, aldaketa klimatikoan, bai? Aldaketa eh klimatikoan eta agrikulturan egiten lan. Orduan horren inguruan egingo du berba. Badakit eh iratzerekin latu batzuk latu duzuela klima aldaketaren gaia, bai? Baina gaur eh hemen egingo dela izango da hau. Ikerke ikerketa lana edo ikerlari baten lana zein den eh jakingo duzu, bai? Miles. Hemen agustin del plan. Como dije, eh Eh, aunque usted puede ser hacer la equimena, un seinda en el burua, eta saludo de su pista, se, se dinámica, son funda y come lo que clase de andar. Por cuanto, María de Quesanti sube en Mesela, bueno, equimena, un ecto que es en la técnica de la y que está ahí a Gelan, eta equimena, otra sortuda, eh, BC Iru, eta, eh, os cojo la receco, es un sasaya de Kim. Bai, bai Agustinek eta bai nik beze iru dut egiteko lan, beze iru da e, ikerketa zentru bat da, e, bilbon dagoena, eta gure ikerketa lerroa da klima aldaketa. Vale? Orduan, e, ekimen hau dara magu e, martxan e, bost urtetan, vale? eta elburua da e, ikerlaria izateko okazioa pizka sustatzea. Vale? Gerturatzea geletara eta zue egiten e, esatea aur, e, gaur egun Euskal, Euskal Herrian ikertzaile izatea, izatea aukera profesional bat dela eta hori izateko zein da bete behar den ibilbidea. Vale? Orduan, e, Agustinek azalduko duena da zein pausu eman dituen ikerlari bilakatzeko. Vale? Orduan, ibilbide horretan e, nahi duguna da e, aur, e, zientziakin e, dauden aurre egitzi batzuk e, sakustea, bale? Eta orduan, lelengo, osa, trakadatu den nahiko enke lelengo mesua da e, ikerlari izateko, osa, jatorria ez duela izan behar, zien, osa, e, deitzen dena e, ba, matematika, erokimika, osa, edo zein ezagutzatik bat eron bat ikerlari bilakatu bil, bil, alda, bale? Orduan, berak esango du zein nani bilbidea, doktoretza bat egin bar da, E, eta azkenean zein da egunereko tasuna eta zertan datza ikerlari izatea, bale? Eta dikusiko dezue, e, e, gaur egun de Euskal Zientzia Zarean aukera profesional bat dela. Eta bestalde, osa, hau da lelengo elburua, eta bestalde gero azalduko du pizkat bere ikerketaren, e, bere ikerketaren ber, bale? Orduan, nahi dudan zuen jakitea da, hau da e, aukera, osa, otso goizko bat, hainbat eta hainbat e, eskari jaso ditugu e, itzaldi hau emoteko geletan eta sosketa bat egitegu eta bueno, aurten ezo ezo gehitu batu zaizue, bale? Orduan, e, intentzioa da, bera, itz egiten doan ginean galderak egitea, bale? E, itzaldia ingeles izango da eta honen zer gaitia da e, zientziaren eskuntza ingelesa dela, bale? Orduan, hori da bigarren mesua honera ekarri nahi duguna da Norbaitek ikerketa e, lan egin nahiko balu, osa, ingelesa jakitea bai ero bai, bestela ez dago aukerari, bale? Horregat egingo du ingelesa, eta gainera esan dugute arazo gabe segituko dezuela itzaldia. Zailatu galderak egiten, e, bat, handei bat dimana zue ingelesez, baina ez bat dimana zaretean usartzen, euskera zero berdea, zekin dezakean zuko dut, be bai, bale? Eta nik kasu, bueno, berak ez dakit euskera, zuko handik itzuliko diot, Eta, beste egin gara, bueno, ba, guztia atzen zuen. Ok. So, <coughs> I've heard that you are very good at English. I have some teachers here that I know that uh, are actually very good at English, one, one of them at least. So, I'm sure you will be also understanding me very well. Ok, these are my coordinates, my email and the uh, Facebook. Uh, Twitter. Uh, so if you have any any questions after this, or any comments after this talk, well, I'm always there, and uh, I, I could be asked answering you if you have questions. Okay. So the main subjects today that I'm going to try to to talk.
talk uh, to you is, uh, in one side is my, the area of science that I have been covering in my career. So uh, basically it's uh, agriculture and climate change. I will go deeply into some of the topics that I have been researching. And also, which I think is uh, more uh, interesting uh, even that, that my, my research is, is my, my role to become a, to becoming a, a scientist. And uh, well, it's, I think it's good uh, information for you to know uh, where I was at your age and how I was evolving to, to the science uh, when the time was passing. <clears throat> so as it has been said now, well, from 2009, which is the, the time that the center was uh, created, I'm, I'm working at the Bath Center for Climate Change. Uh, this is the website. It's not, it doesn't show there the, the path. But, uh, and this is my uh, personal website there with all of the information. So unlike other, uh, other professions, uh, we need to be very accountable, which means that uh, if you type my name, you will find a lot of information about what I do, uh, what type of uh, things I have been doing, what type of uh, projects I'm involved. So you have uh, all of the information there in the, in the website. So to start with, I, I wanted to really talk a little bit about, uh, if you wonder what uh, a normal day of a scientist uh, may be, obviously you may have in mind uh, the typical scientist in a, in a laboratory or uh, doing, uh, well, uh, doing other type of things. Uh, at the beginning of my career it's true that I was doing a lot of uh, research in, in laboratories and, uh, and also in, in, in fields as well, but at the moment I spend most of my time uh, in front of the computer, so I don't do really uh, physical experiments at this at this moment. I mean, uh, the type of things that I do, for example, is well, uh, first you formulate the uh, hypothesis uh, of what you are going to study. Then you you gather data, uh, with other colleagues, other experiments, you analyze this data. There's a lot of numbers, a lot of maths uh, around that. You have to read other scientists, uh, other work. You have to compile all, the, all of the information, and in my case, uh, my specific area of uh, within agricultural and climate change is uh, called uh, modeling, uh, mathematical modeling, which uh, means that I also have to, to know about programming, and uh, therefore I will have to, to know about how to code uh, the information into a computer uh, uh, language. Other things that I uh, would be involved with, well, these are examples of, of the screens of some of the models I have been developing. Uh, one thing that is very important for a uh, scientist is to, to write all of these uh, science in, in uh, this is for examples of, of some of the publications. These are uh, in journals, international journals, that uh, have to be uh, reviewed by other researchers. Sometimes you submit these uh, these pieces of uh, studies, and uh, they may be rejected, they may be accepted, but uh, you have to make a lot of changes. And to the scientific community, uh, well, accept that the results are uh, have been following the scientific method. But there are also the type of things that uh, we can write. This is information for the policymakers. So this is a report that I was recently uh, involved for the United Nations Environmental uh, Protection Agency about the oxide emissions. Also, you can write the uh, books. This is a chapter. Or also, because we are generally involved in different type of projects, uh, and these are funded by uh, public uh, money, you also need to give reports which become, uh, in a lot of cases, public. So these are also information that you need to uh, write, which is our, uh, well, the whole uh, results of your, your research. These are uh, um, scientific technical reports. But also, we have to also do, try to do a, a little bit of knowledge uh, transfer to the society, so we have to also write uh, information in a different language that uh, different uh, agents in the society might understand and goes beyond the, the scientific uh, language. Uh, so, so we have some, some examples here. And moreover, in my case as well, I'm a co-blogger, so I, 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 well, I write in a blog, so again, this is uh, information that is uh, publicly available, and this information that we are trying to, to compile uh, from the science to, to a more, uh, well, uh, a more easy going uh, language uh, for the society. So, 
other things that I, I do during my time, uh, for example, I, 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 I get involved in management. I am currently the coordinator of the, the Spanish network of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and agriculture. So this takes up some of my time. These are some photos of some of the meetings that we are holding. This is something that we have uh, uh, started uh, from uh, three years ago. Uh, again, uh, for example, within this uh, network, we also try, like I said before, but this in, uh, in a more organized way, uh, trying to disseminate uh, the, the compilation of information, scientific information that we are gathering into a more uh, easy-going uh, language. So we have our blog, we have our Twitter, we have uh, Facebook, and we have other uh, social, uh, we are also involved in other social networks. Some of the research that I, I will be involved uh, may have uh, an impact in the media, not necessarily the most important. Sometimes it's, uh, it, it, I have to admit that it may be random that they pick up some, uh, some uh, research that you have uh, been doing. It may be international, so there's some newspapers here that we were involved in uh, internationally, nationally or, or more locally. Um, <clears throat> Once uh, the researcher become more experienced, uh, it uh, becomes also well uh, more uh, needed in, in representation. For example, uh, in this case, in my case, uh, I, I have to attend some meetings that have to do with uh, with some uh, global worldwide initiatives. In this case, about the uh, reduction of greenhouse gases in agriculture. So I'm a Spanish representative in uh, in one of these uh, initiatives. I'm also an associate editor of, of a journal, which means uh, I have duties of a scientific journal which have to do with, uh, well, with uh, reviewing uh, what other people are, are trying to submit in this journal. And uh, well, this is some part of my, my work. So, <clears throat> something that I already mentioned as well, important, there's a lot of meetings. Uh, when I'm in meetings, you have to talk a lot, you have to share information, you have to share your knowledge, you have to share your hypothesis. There is a lot of uh, personal uh, uh, connections as well. So these are some examples. You meet in projects, networks, uh, congresses, and that's uh, where you uh, probably develop new ideas. Once you become more experienced as well, when you were uh, younger and you were less experienced, you were uh, you, know, you had people that were uh, really teaching you or mentoring, and, and now once you become uh, more experienced, uh, you have a duty to also pass this information to younger people. And in this case, is just an example of a thesis that was defended on, in December, uh, one of my students. So that was when, when she successfully uh, got the, the, the grade of thesis. So, yeah, I have to attend a lot of lectures, conferences in different uh, areas. And, which is uh, important and why I'm here today, is uh, it's very important to give back something to society, which means, uh, in this case, uh, well, try to, well, in this case, uh, try to show a little bit of my experience, try to, to see if uh, you have questions, if you have uh, uh, ideas, uh, and if well, if, if this can be really uh, something that can motivate you to, to go to one path or another once you finish uh, your, uh, your studies here and you may decide to go to university or may decide other things. So what are the big questions that I'm trying to, to sort out uh, in, my, in my research? I, I ha as I have mentioned, uh, I'm mainly focusing on climate change and agriculture. I could say, moreover, that it's not just agriculture, but uh, also food production, and uh, how this is affecting uh, climate change. I'm also looking at the opposite direction, how climate change may, may affect uh, uh, agriculture, but I'm only focusing today on, on, on these aspects of how agriculture or food production may affect climate change. And also, which is uh, very important, in, the, in a growing population that we, we, we are having now in the world, how we can uh, feed uh, the planet uh, without uh, having this impact or others, uh, or having a, a smaller impact on the environment and on the, on the climate change. So I suppose that all of you know about the, the climate change effect. Uh, 
the, the research I have been uh, following uh, is dealing with the part that has to do with climate change that is uh, has to do with uh, the generation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The greenhouse gas effect, uh, I'm sure you know, is, is a natural effect in the Earth that allows uh, the Earth to, to have life. So it has the temperature uh, that is uh, good enough for us to live here. What has happened is that in the last, uh, well, from the Industrial Revolution, possibly a century and a half ago, that's when it started, the concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions have uh, increased. These uh, gases, uh, they have the, the power to, to attract heat from the, from the sun. So which means that if you increase the concentration of these gases, the, the capacity of the atmosphere to trap heat or an energy increases and that affects the, the global climate and that's what we have been uh, seeing. So some of the greenhouse gases that uh, are very important are water vapor, are uh, CO2, which is the most known. Uh, is, uh, CO2 is carbon dioxide, uh, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, ozone, also the, the fluor fluorocarbon uh, gases. And uh, well, agriculture and, uh, and land use is estimated that contributes about 25%. When I say other land, uh, land use, I, I also talk about forestry. Of all of the greenhouse gases that demand uh, is estimated to, to emit, 20, about 25% both directly uh, comes from agriculture, indirectly through some energy as well uh, use, and also through, through land use uh, change. So it's a, an important effect uh, from demand that possibly in a lot of cases the, maybe it's not as well now as the effect that the industry might have, the sector of the industry. So when we think about uh, these type of postcards, uh, these type of pictures, we might wonder, well, but, but does it really look like this can affect really climate change or, or have any, any kind of environmental uh, uh, pollution? Well, we can look at this, it's not very, very far from here. But we can also think about, the, about agriculture in these terms which is more, uh, for least in the last century, what it has become uh, broadly our food production, which is a very industry-based uh, uh, kind of uh, agriculture. I mean, I have to tell you that in all the cases, even in the nice postcards, there is generation of greenhouse gas emissions. So there is a part that is unavoidable. Certainly, this will have a greater impacts, but uh, this is something that we need to, anyway, evaluate and see how we can reduce this impact. So, with this picture, what I want to show you is uh, well, a little bit how, uh, what are the principles uh, and the components that are affecting this uh, generation of greenhouse gas emissions in, uh, in the typical agricultural uh, system. So, the agricultural system has two different things from other uh, se sectors, like the industry sector. One important thing is that the carbon dioxide, uh, in this case, uh, the agriculture may in one uh, form absorbed by photosynthesis, so it's a positive thing that agriculture can do uh, towards the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, so it absorbs the CO2, but also, so it's a positive thing, that's why I put a smile, but uh, most of this uh, CO2 goes to biomass from the plant, and this can be eaten by animals and then eaten by, by, uh, by humans, but uh, also this CO2 that goes into biomass and organic matter, a lot will be lost uh, from the respiration processes or the composition in very a very uh, fast uh, time. Uh, so in a way there is a kind of a balance between uh, the absorption of CO2 that is uh, provoked uh, by photosynthesis and the emission of this CO2 emission by uh, respiration uh, or the composition. This is not uh, a CO2 that we are that, uh, that uh, worried. The CO2 that we are worried uh, in agriculture we are more worried about the, the, the one that has to do with burning or the one that has to do with, uh, with using fossil fuels like uh, oil or gas, which that means that it's a CO2 emission that is, uh, that is generally uh, like a net emission to the atmosphere. Second thing from the agricultural systems that is very important is that the most important uh, gases really in, uh, in, the, in the agricultural sector uh, as contrast to other sectors like industry, is our methane and nitrous oxide, which are less now greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, 
it's estimated that methane uh, emissions from humans, 50% uh, come from agricultural practices, and about 60% of nitrous oxide emissions uh, come from agricultural practices. Uh, to put in perspective, methane and nitrous oxide, there, are, there is less concentration in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, but they have a greater uh, warming potential than CO2. That's why we say that they are very potent uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In, in the case, methane has about 21 times uh, more powerful, and, uh, and nitrous oxide about uh, 310 times. Uh, another thing that is very important to to highlight here is that uh, both emissions from methane and from nitrous oxide are caused by biological processes. So in a way, they are very difficult to be controlled and uh, they are very influenced by environmental conditions. So methane generally occurs uh, in anaerobic conditions, so when there is no oxygen, so for example in fermentation processes, so that may happen when waste is uh, decomposing or uh, for example in, in crops like rice where you have a lot of water so there's no oxygen and um, uh, very importantly in, in animals like the ruminants that they have a special uh, way to, to digest and uh, in their, one of their stomachs they, they do this uh, fermentation uh, and they produce a lot of methane. In the case of nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide is a byproduct of the nitrogen cycle specifically from uh, processes like denitrification and nitrification. These are bacterial uh, processes that mainly occur in the soil but also in the organic matter uh, decomposition in the terms of nitrogen. Okay. So two important aspects of the, of the research about the greenhouse gas emission and agriculture are measuring and quantifying but also in a more applicable way is uh, how to reduce these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that would be what we call a mitigation of climate change. So in terms of uh, measuring and quantification, I have to tell you that it's not easy. This is some of the equipment that I have been using in the previously. Now I'm not uh, measuring in the field. But uh, I have to say that because you deal with, uh, with the semi-natural uh, environments, so you deal with soil, you, you deal with plants, you deal, you deal with animals, you deal with waste. It's not as easy to, to measure uh, as what you would be measuring a gas from an industry, from a, from a chimney. You have a lot of variation, a lot of variability from, from the soil. One part there is very different from another. You have environmental conditions like uh, rain and temperature that is affecting all the time. You have the animals that you cannot control where they are, for example, if they are in the field. And the plants as well, they are also interacting with the system. And uh, some uh, plants may, may be uh, behaving different than other plants. So it's, uh, it's a difficult task. The scale is something very, very important. And this is, this is something that I would like to also highlight from, my, from this part of the talk. That we may be looking at uh, some researchers and very specific things like at the fine scale, like uh, okay, let's see how much methane produces a, a cow, how much entro uh, emissions or carbon uh, sequestration can be done in this field. But if we look at the bigger picture, which is uh, very interesting, and that's what I'm trying to, to show in this picture, this is a study that we have been recently involved, and, and we were trying to see the responsibility that the Spanish uh, agriculture had on uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, in this case in uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Generally, uh, every country, and even the Basque country, does inventories of greenhouse gas emissions, and these inventories only deal with the greenhouse gases that are produced from the activities you have in the, in the land, or in, the, in your place. But we were trying to, to analyze here was the, the type of impact we were having in other places in the world uh, by consuming uh, some type of food or by feeding uh, some type of feed to our animals, which are generally this type of feed is imported. So this uh, feed, the emissions that are uh, cause, causing, they would, wouldn't be uh, captured in our inventories. So what we were uh, looking in this case, what we're finding is that most of our emissions uh, from our consumption or even production in our, in our for example, in our uh, livestock was coming from, uh, was originating in other places like uh, Brazil from uh, importing a lot of uh, soybeans, for example. So these emissions, we were not accounting as uh, our emissions, 
because these emissions are occurring elsewhere. But in terms of responsibility, we are uh, producing or even consuming uh, these goods. So we are trying to look at this way uh, to see well, how, in some cases, uh, trying to reduce emissions here, only here, may not be as effective if you don't take into account uh, the emissions that are linked in other places in, in the world to our uh, food that we are consuming or we are producing. In this case, uh, when I talk about consumption, it's very important to, to highlight as well here that a lot of, uh, a lot of the research has been uh, showing that diet, human diet, makes a, a difference on our uh, footprint, carbon footprint. So our impact on greenhouse gas emissions globally. So in this case, protein consumption is very much linked to, to greenhouse gas emissions intensity. So uh, with no surprise, in these two uh, maps of the of the Earth of the of the world, you would have that the that the countries with the bigger protein consumption, uh, both in total or per capita, or uh, or those in terms of uh, animal protein would always be in the north uh, of the hemispheres of the, the richest countries. Okay. So <clears throat> one important thing to link to the previous idea is that uh, well, why do we say that uh, in this case, in this case, animal protein, for example, is uh, is very intensive in greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the estimates globally, and this is a FAO, so it's not. Uh, it's not a, an estimate from uh, no one. Uh, the estimate is if we think about calories, the whole worldwide calories, about two thirds of those that are produced uh, in crops, are uh, not going directly to the humans. So one third, which is very important, would be lost in, in different uh, ways of the uh, food production. Another third would be used to feed animals that we later will eat, so okay, one, some part of that protein will come back to the, to the humans, but the animals are not uh, obviously that efficient, so it's only a, a percentage of these calories that they can, uh, they can uh, accumulate. And about 6% of these uh, crop calories uh, will be going to produce energy. Okay, so uh, what I'm uh, trying to say is that, uh, well, uh, the agri-food system, which would be like trying to encompass all of the all of the uh, stages of food production, uh, from the from the cropping to the time that we have our food in our in our plate, is a very inefficient uh, uh, system as we have it now. So, uh, and there are a lot of uh, aspects that have to be taken into account when uh, when you hear information about well, we probably need to produce much more in the future because we will be much uh, many more people. Well, another way to, to think about it would be to think, well, maybe we need to lose uh, less because we, we are having a lot of losses in the, in, the big, in the process. Or another thing would be, well, I mean, uh, if we think about the, the share of the protein and calories in the world, there are some places in the world that are actually consuming uh, about 300, like here, possibly 300 more uh, proteins than the... Than the the, the OMS would be uh, indicating that it's healthy. Whereas other places, we typically think of Africa, South, South America, some places in, in Asia, don't have enough of these uh, proteins or calories. So another thing would be, well, maybe we should better distribute this, uh, this food as well. So another way to look at this, uh, at, at this uh, problem would be trying to, to look at what we call a, a carbon footprint of a, of a product. And in this case, as we are talking, talking about food, I will be talking about the carbon footprint of product. Even though we talk about carbon, again, I have to stress it. This is the, one of the only things that you get from this talk. Uh, it's okay. So, because it's generally thought that it's only carbon that comes, it, it relates to carbon dioxide. Well, when we talk about carbon footprint, we relate to all of the greenhouse gas emissions, like I've been saying before. We translate everything into CO2, but we mean CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and other gases. So the way we can calculate or estimate the carbon footprint of greenhouse gas footprint of a, of a product is trying to see 
in the whole uh, production of a, of a whole cycle of producing a good, in this case a, a food, what is the impact on greenhouse gas emissions? So for example, we can think about one kilogram of meat or one uh, liter of, of milk. So the main sources of the greenhouse gas emissions would be the, the energy that is produced in the that is used in the directly in the farm or in that <coughs> when you have to manufacture and produce uh, fertilizers. We have the cow which is producing uh, methane for example. We have the waste that the animal is producing in terms of excreta and etc. And that produces methane and other greenhouse gases like the nitrous oxide. The soil can be acting as a, as a sink for carbon, but also it can happen uh, nitrous oxide emissions once you fertilize. And the plants may act as a sink for CO2 through photosynthesis, but they, they will also be doing uh, processes of uh, respiration. Okay, so we can actually make a close circle here between the, what is the meat, milk, the animal, the waste that the animal produces. This waste may be recycled uh, eventually in the soil, but some will be lost. And uh, some of this uh, carbon uh, in the soil will come from the waste, but will also come from the decomposition of the plants. And the plants will be taking up uh, the CO2 from the photosynthesis of the, the CO2 from the atmosphere. <coughs> so that will establish. Uh, they will also emit CO2 from respiration, uh, the soil, the waste, the plant, the animal. Okay. So if we look at the, the whole life cycle analysis, we we starting from uh, from the end, which would be uh, the food that you have in the plant. So you have milk, you have meat, you have the link to the cow. So to produce, to transport this uh, first, to transport this meat or milk to the supermarket or, or shop, you will need uh, also energy of uh, manufacturing, uh, well, uh, distributing, uh, packaging, processing. That would be uh, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Like I said before, there is energy that is used in the farm as well, so this is greenhouse gas emissions. The animal produces methane, greenhouse gas emissions. These are some numbers from different animals. We also produce some, so we are not, uh, but it's generally the, the greater share of the methane emissions in animals are coming from ruminants. <coughs> So the waste from the animal also may produce uh, methane and nitrous oxide when it's uh, uh, stored or reapplied to the soil. The feed of the animals are, uh, are an important source of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Some of the, the plants, as I said before, they can decompose whatever you don't harvest and come back to the soil and there will be some energy that is used as well in the tractors and, and other uh, <coughs> and other mechanization aspects. There will be uh, fertilizer that we use and there is uh, also large uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming from uh, manufacturing uh, or uh, making this uh, fertilizer in, in factories. But also once you apply it to the soil, that will also be a lot of uh, end to emissions uh, from this nitrogen uh, that is applied, being applied to the, to the soil. So this is an example from one of our studies. Uh, this would be the carbon footprint for, from milk in uh, that was uh, about 17 farms in, in Carranza. Uh, that's in Vizcaya. So some of the possibly the milk that you are uh, consuming would come from this uh, from these farms. And uh, one thing that we were getting in our uh, calculations were that the the impact was about one or two kilograms uh, of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. So we, we are talking about carbon dioxide N2O and methane. Uh, per liter of milk, and uh, it was interesting to look that uh, from the whole uh, footprint, about 43% uh, uh, was being housed cost in activities that were not uh, linked directly to what was happening in the farm. So in this case, it was a big impact of greenhouse gas emissions emitted uh, in uh, in the production of the feed that was uh, bought by, by the farmers. So there was a lot of, uh, in the ingredients of the feed that they were buying, there was a lot of uh, soybeans, for example, that has a quite large uh, greenhouse gas impact, generally coming from South America, and generally uh, causing uh, well, uh, deforestation uh, by implementing new, new crops. Uh, they are uh, replacing the old forest with, uh, with these uh, cropping systems. 
So you may wonder, in a practical way, what, what can we do, really? Is there anything that I can do, or, or this is something for, uh, for the big companies or the governments uh, to really act? Obviously, there is, uh, there is big responsibilities from uh, people in power, uh, in politics and uh, in companies, but we also have to take into account that we have also uh, potential things that we can do as, uh, as citizens and, and as, well, as consumers in this case. So I, I was going to put an example uh, comparing what would be the, this carbon footprint uh, of, uh, of food, in this case milk and meat that we were now just talking, comparing with the carbon footprint that could be caused by some of our transport. And I'm going to just put an example from myself, so, uh, so I, I hopefully it becomes more clear. So, so we can uh, have an idea that uh, for milk, we, we said before, it's about one or two kilograms of CO2 per, per liter of milk, that is the carbon footprint, and for meat it will be more intensive in greenhouse gases, for meat, uh, beef meat, so that would be about uh, 15 to 20 kilograms of CO2. So we think about transport, some estimates, it's not perfect, I may ask you an example, if you go by car, it's the worst uh, situation, about 0 0.30 uh, kilograms CO2 per kilometer, and uh, obviously just traveling one person, so it's the worst situation to one of the best situations uh, of uh, public transport that would be going by metro, which would be 0 0.026. So if I think about my working days, which uh, I don't know if it's 220, but I just estimate 220 days, uh, I live here in Alberta and I work in Bilbao. I also like milk, so I estimate that I like, well, I, I drink about half a liter, maybe a day maybe more or less. So, for my working days, that would be about 110 uh, liters per year. That would equate uh, in CO2 uh, emissions equivalent, about 110 to 110 kilograms of CO2 per year. That's my footprint in terms of milk consumption. If I think about uh, my traveling to work, okay, I go by metro to Bilbao from Algorta, so that's about 15 kilometers, okay, going back as well, so that's uh, multiplied by 2, 120 days, so about uh, 6,600 kilometers per year. So I calculate, estimate that it's about, uh, in the end, in CO2 emissions, about 171 uh, CO2 emissions. So it's about in the range of uh, my carbon footprint of my milk consumption. Okay, this is just information to have an idea. Okay. We could make it uh, well, other comparison with meat, which is more carbon intensive. So I don't need two kilograms per week, but there might be some people that eat two kilograms per week of meat, beef meat. So that would be about 105. I eat much less, I have to say. Uh, so that would be about 1.5, uh, 2.1 tons, or well, 2,000 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalents per year. And that would really uh, be in the range of uh, if I thought about uh, my transport, if I went to Bilbao every day by car, which would be about, uh, yeah, about 2,100 kilo, uh, kilograms uh, per, of CO2. So that would just uh, make a, a reflection here, so which maybe would be better to become a vegetarian that goes by car, than uh, maybe uh, better than a meat eater that uh, goes by, by bicycle, would produce maybe similar. Uh, footprint, final footprint. So some other questions, this is just trying to finish this part that is, has to do with the science that uh, I'm, uh, have been uh, involved with. Some other questions, big questions that we are trying to sort out are, uh, for example, in terms of uh, producing energy with, uh, with, uh, with crops or, or with waste that comes from agriculture. Uh, we are trying to see whether it's good for the environment or really good for the environment or good for the climate. So we have been uh, doing some uh, latest research on that. We can have a, as well a hypothesis and, and test uh, whether organic, which is ecologic food, can be better or worse or equally to, uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than conventional food. We may think about waste management, and this is some uh, study that we have been uh, producing uh, recently as well, about the impact uh, that composting has. Uh, whether it's a better impact than other waste management to have in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, also, we, we are investigating 
what uh, alternative uh, feed there is for the animals to produce the same, but with, uh, with uh, fewer with fewer impact to the environment. And uh, we are also involved uh, currently in a project that had just started to, to look at uh, how uh, dairy farms, in this case, can adapt to uh, well, to the perspective uh, warming uh, conditions that may be in the future, especially to do with uh, animal productivity, environmental uh, pollution, and also in terms of uh, animal welfare, which means the happiness of the animals uh, in, uh, in the face of, uh, of uh, heat stress uh, conditions in the future. So, well, I'm going to pass now to another part of, of, my, of my presentation, which uh, it's uh, possibly less intense in, in data, but uh, maybe more interesting. And, and it's uh, trying to see from uh, more or less your age how I have become to whatever I am now or whatever I'm doing now. So I try to illustrate that to this kind of game. I don't know how, how, how you say it in English, so, uh, but I mean, I think it's quite illustrative. So I'm starting in the, with the red, red one here. Okay, and it's pretty self explanatory. So I have to talk about, uh, well, I didn't go to, I went to school, I'm uh, from Portugal, so I went to this school. So uh, at your point, I suppose uh, it was my third, uh, third of uh, book, uh, that's, I don't know if you are first or second batch here, uh, but more or less, 17, 16 years old. So, okay, I was interested in science. Uh, at home, like uh, well, like the games and stuff and lab, but was well, that successful at, at school? Well, I think this is at this time it's interesting for you to see this uh, these marks, and I might not say much. <laughs> okay, I don't know if this is good uh, good uh, information for your teachers, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> according to that, I was not a very good student. <laughs> Well, I was saying here, yeah, if these marks they continue like this, I want to pass the, the, the year. So that was the year before the last year of the... So it was first batch year, I suppose. Okay, I was, I was okay in English. That's something that you may think, well, it's okay. He has... Uh, he's showing something in English. I was okay in religion. Fine, good. Uh, okay, in sports. But there was no things I was Okay. No comment. Okay, I don't know if I have to tell you the message from here or if it's uh, something that you can think about. I mean, I hope you don't get the wrong message. And uh, if you have good marks, just go to this if you want to become a scientist. It's just that, well, sometimes it's, uh, you may feel down, you may have uh, this type of. Uh, the motivation, but I mean, it's still time to, to change. I passed the, that year, so at the end of the year, I don't know how I did it, but I, I didn't have to repeat the, the year. And uh, also, the last year was also difficult, but I also passed. So there is, uh, there is hope for everyone. Or not hope, if you, if you consider that this is not worth the scientific career, it's up to you. Okay. So, okay, as I said, I was successful, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I passed exams, I went to uh, the selectividad, I don't know how it's called now, or uh, final exam. And then I, that was a decision time to choose uh, what to do. So, because it's true that I didn't have very good marks, obviously I, I couldn't choose for the, for the career that, uh, that was uh, asking for the better marks. But I chose for something that I really liked, which was uh, biology. So I was really always, well, of all of the subjects, that was something that I was really interested in, if I could say. And once you start the university, in my case at least, uh, uh, and once you progress even in university, you become more specialized and you become more motivated with, uh, with whatever you are studying. I, I, uh, I, my experience is that, uh, well, first you all have uh, very broad subjects, but then you pass to, to something more specific and that's when you get uh, more interested and that's when you put more efforts or, or less efforts. So okay, that's uh, my title, my grade as a biologist. Okay. So at that point, what do you do now? You finish the career, you finish the grade. 
Okay, years have changed now. I don't know how is it now. How many years you have to do for a career? I think it's four, or it's changing to four or three. But uh, well, uh, if you want to to start doing research, then you either do a master. So you keep this a little bit keep on studying. It's generally not paid unless you get a grant. It's very rare. Or you also keep on studying, which is generally paid in some cases, which is uh, doing a PhD. Which is a post, uh, well, a doctoral uh, study, and that takes about four, five years. It depends. In some countries, they might even be cleverer than us, and they do it in three years. So another possibility is teaching you. I have the, I, I mean, I did the, the, the course, but I mean, no way I will be teaching you. This is it's very hard. You could do other different things. Uh, you could try to become, in my case, as a biologist, to be in a laboratory, become a technician. Oh, just do nothing, well, mm -hmm. or migrate, or whatever. <laughs> so, in terms of what is a PhD in physics? Well, this is a piece of uh, work that you do, as I said, four or five years. It has to be original science. So, an original piece of uh, research. And from that you get uh, what is called a doctoral grade. Okay. Obviously, it's, uh, in my case, well, this is uh, science, so you need to follow the scientific method. And uh, as I said before, for five years. And uh, if you want to become a researcher, a scientist, it's very difficult to, to really uh, follow a career uh, without a PhD. So I mean, it's, it's a requisite. A requisite. So, at that point myself, okay, I wanted to do a PhD, so that was 1997. So, well, the possibility is that obviously you wanted to well, get some money to do that, not just live on your parents for the whole life. So, that's uh, where I had to apply for several grants, and in one of the grants I was uh, lucky uh, to get into my PhD, and that was my first experience, which was uh, in uh, Sima, Nature. It's the main center in, uh, in the Basque Country for agricultural studies. I was placed in Nature, that was 1997. Okay. And my first uh, subject was uh, trying to understand what is the effect of, uh, of the farmers uh, that might have uh, in combination with weather conditions, soil conditions, on the environmental losses. So, again, a little bit like I'm still doing now, uh, at the moment, but in a different uh, format because I was doing a field experiments. Uh, I thought it was interesting. So this is my first uh, study. That was a study that I carried out in a, in a greenhouse. And that was, uh, I took the soil in different uh, pots, and I was analyzing uh, nitrous oxide emissions and nitric oxide emissions from these soils. Uh, with different fertilizer additions and with different uh, water addition. So what I found, and that was published in the paper, uh, that was one of my first papers, was that uh, with more water the, in the soil and with more uh, fertilization, the nitrous oxide uh, was larger. So it was a uh, bigger impact. So the conditions in the soil to do with the water have to do very much uh, with the emissions that are produced in the soil. So, I mean, we could follow this type of trend, so we think that this is soil moisture, so water in the soil, so the emissions uh, grow until one point that becomes uh, more stable. So as I mentioned before, and I have been mentioning, it's very important for scientists to produce this type of information in uh, journals, scientific journals, and uh, well, this uh, example, this is the, the most, uh, the format that is uh, safer in terms of uh, contrasted science. It's uh, contrasting because uh, it would have been reviewed by uh, different scientists in the world, and as I said before, once you submit, you show this uh, uh, the document, you send the document, and it might be rejected if it doesn't uh, uh, get to the right standards. There are other sources to show your, uh, your, uh, your science, but obviously you need to be careful for example, in internet, because you never know how uh, how uh, true can be this uh, this type of sources. There are books, there are congresses, there is software. So, <clears throat> my experience again. So when I was there in uh, in Delhi, uh, well, I, I was involved as well in my first uh, European project with different countries: Germany, Poland, 
uh, United Kingdom, the Netherlands. <coughs> That's when I understood that it's not about working on your own, or working with your own, uh, your own things, but it's basically a lot, and I put it a, a big uh, words, it's about collaboration with other people. It's also about competition, like in other terms in, uh, in, uh, in life, but I would put it in a much smaller uh, uh, world. It's, uh, it's less important, but I cannot deny that it's also some. Uh, so this is some uh, photograph of uh, well, measuring the coalition. We're well, not really measuring at that point. That was in Poland. So we would be doing uh, every week. Uh, sorry, uh, we'll be doing uh, weekly uh, field campaigns in different countries, measuring uh, different soils, uh, the whole thing. So after that, I also did experiments in farms. Where, well, it's not very nice, so I just thought, well, maybe better to try to work in front of the computer. So that's when I tried to, to start uh, well, thinking about, uh, well, doing something more about farm uh, modeling, which is a mathematical modeling. And that's when I uh, tried to talk with the Dutch team, the people uh, from the Netherlands that were experts on that. <coughs> so that's, that's what a mathematical model uh, would it be, uh, well, is, is trying to conceptualize uh, what is reality to compute a program and trying to, to put that in, the, in terms of mathematics, in terms of the uh, computer language, to try to, to, uh, well, to put all the components of the system that you are understanding, that you are trying to, to study in the same uh, framework, these are examples. So my experience then uh, to, to try to, to start this type of uh, research, I had to, go, had to go to the Netherlands, which was the team that uh, knew about that in the Basque Country or even in Spain, there wouldn't be anyone that would know about this subject at that time. So in 2000, I went to the Netherlands to the Wageningen, which is, a, well, this, according to the ranking, the second best university in the world in terms of agriculture and forestry. So it's the only one in top 10 that is not from the United States. So that's some uh, pictures of my place. So that's when I developed, that's in the, in the menu. Of a, of a restaurant, conceptually, like writing the, my first model, <laughs> mathematical model, that was then later published and, uh, and then uh, called it into a, into a program. <laughs> so at that point, once you finish the, your PhD thesis, there are several possibilities. You may become a researcher in a research center, like I'm now. So you would start from the postdoc position, postdoctoral, uh, to create your team or well, go and beyond, well, you are lucky, very lucky, or have good friends, become a Nobel Prize winner. You can do similar things at university, but maybe you have to also, apart from uh, research, do uh, lectures in the university to, to become like uh, a teacher. You can do other things, or again, it's also a possibility of doing nothing. So in 2002, I became a postdoctoral uh, researcher. So um, I, at this point, I decided to travel away again. And in this case, I went to the Institute of Grata and ran the research IGAR that was in the United Kingdom in England, in south of uh, England. This is uh, that's the Norwich uh, Research Station. It's a, it's a station that has uh, quite a wide uh, history there. So this uh, information there dates back from uh, well, the, the, the period uh, from 1949 to 2009. And this, uh, this institute now has become part of uh, what is uh, Rolf Amstel Research, which is the longest running uh, research center in, in the world uh, in terms of our report, it dates back about 200 years. Okay. So I was there for about seven years, so five years as a postdoctoral, and uh, two I was promoted as a senior researcher, where I for my, my own group there. And then, well, there I have my mentor. Uh, it's not a typical researcher, as you can see, typical scientist or typical English, as you can see. That's some of the models that we were involved in the development. So this is one of the most important ones that I'm um, probably most known about, which is a model that uh, tries to, to study the whole farm sustainability, not just the environment uh, in terms of greenhouse gases or other gases or pollution to waters, but also trying to integrate, which, which was quite unique uh, social and economic aspects of the farms, which had to do with milk quality, soil quality, animal welfare, landscape aesthetic, and biodiversity. Okay, at that point, I was involved in some uh, aspects that uh, were used uh, for changing some regulations 
environmental regulation, so that's why you really think as well and, and feel that uh, your uh, research is, uh, is being used and is being uh, useful for something when it's applied to uh, legislation and that can be applicable to real people like farmers in this case. So, well, I even uh, did some lectures in the Royal Society, so that's something that is always nice to have in the picture. But the most important thing from this experience was really the personal thing, so I have some photos there of some of my ex-colleagues, and uh, still some of them are, uh, are friends, uh, more than colleagues, some people even uh, come around and visit me now uh, on the personal side, so, well, it's a very, very good uh, experience. And uh, that comes back to, to the moment, which uh, I'm now, from 2009, in Basque in Center for Climate Change. And uh, with that, I think, uh, I think I'm finished. I'm ready for questions. So the farms that are using less of these ingredients are the ones that have a fewer impact uh, as a carbon footprint. But what I have to say uh, in their defense, this is all driven by prices of feed and by the structure of the, of the farms, in this case in here and in a lot of places. And the regulations that are around that the favor have been favoring these imports of uh, of feed. Tampoco lo llamamos empresa porque la empresa tiene la connotación de que es un centro que tiene 
que, bueno, que es capaz de hacer dinero, que en realidad es el centro de financiación pública, que en, en una gran base tiene que ver con el gobierno vasco. Yo soy un empleado, o sea, sí, sería un investigador. Cuando digo nosotros es porque lo que he comentado ahí, que es muy importante, es que generalmente los estudios, eh, en mi área al menos, es de, vamos, el mérito no es una persona, generalmente es de un equipo. Y muchas veces ni tan siquiera es solo el equipo de, del BC3, puede ser un equipo de, de otros sitios de, de aquí, de Euskadi, pero puede ser, generalmente no, generalmente de otros sitios de, internacionalmente de otros lados. Vale. se tienen que imponer unas, unas normas y dentro de esas normas estaba la norma de, de, un, de tener una máxima fertilización de 170 kilogramos de nitrógeno por hectárea ¿vale? entonces lo que se promulga en, esta, en, en este cambio de la legislación en, la Unión, en, en el Reino Unido era que había unos estudios que en casos excepcionales se podía ir a otra cifra mayor Ya no se está emitiendo al ingeniero, tienes que no sé qué, porque hay más salida. Lo de las salidas cambia de dos años. Yo cuando estaba estudiando tenía mucha salida ser enfermero, por ejemplo, y luego después de unos años había mucho paro. Eh, lo que te querría decir con esto es que si realmente te gusta deberías a, se, lo deberías hacer y luego uno se va buscando la salida. Hay, en esos momentos, como en otras cosas, como se basa bastante en dinero público, eh, aquí hay problemas, eh, pero bueno, eh, para mantener a la gente que no se vaya afuera, por ejemplo. Vale. <risa> pero el principal mensaje es hacer lo que vosotros queráis y penséis que os motiva más, que es donde realmente vais a conseguir eh, ir a los sitios. Es una pena que no esté antes ah, un profesor vuestro porque era compañero mío. Voy a ver eso una vez. Eh, ha comentado que luego te quieres saludar por Dios. Dealing. 
once you become more experienced, you have more uh, freedom. I have to say that in the bar center for climate change, I'm very privileged, I feel, that I can do what I uh, really feel like. Generally, it's, it's a two-way uh, process. In one way, one expects uh, that the researcher informs the policymaker about what are the hypotheses or the needs in research that could be interesting for the society. But also there is, like you say, the, the policy maker, the government, have to give you as well the, the priorities. And the, in this case, for example, the, the Spanish, and I think the Basque as well, which is kind of replicating all the Spanish, the Basque, and the, to the European, they, they are, for example, uh, now uh, organizing the funding in, in topics that are called uh, challenges, retos, uh, social challenges. So generally the challenges are more important for society, supposedly, so you need to align your research. Obviously these are very broad challenges, so climate change is uh, if you want to challenge, for example, so it's very broad. Thank you. Gracias.